This is experiment seven, the separation of three organic compounds by acid-base reactions and liquid-liquid extractions. So at this point, we should all be familiar with acid-base reactions, also known as proton transfer reactions. And we should also be familiar with the practical technique of liquid-liquid extractions, right? That's where we separate one compound out of one layer or phase uh, away from the other. In this particular experiment, we are starting with uh, three organic compounds, which have uh, different properties in terms of uh, their acidity. And so the first compound is benzoic acid, and benzoic acid, which we dealt with in the partition coefficient experiment, uh, is of course an acid. It has a pK value of 4.19. The second compound that we're going to deal with is uh, benzocaine, which is a local anesthetic, also known as ethyl paraaminobenzoate. Uh, it's in this IUPAC setting of naming because it is an ethyl ester of paraaminobenzoic acid. Uh, and we estimate that its pKa is around 2.5 when protonated. So when that, uh, when benzocaine is protonated, its conjugate acid has a pKa of 2.5. So as a result, we're saying that benzocaine is a base. And then the last compound is 9-fluorinone, which is a conjugated ketone, uh, which is neutral. There are no acidic protons. And so. What that means is, is that we can use the um, acid-base properties to our uh, advantage to try and separate the three compounds uh, from an organic solvent. So just briefly to state, we are going to separate benzocaine by isolating it as its hydrogen chloride salt and at that particular pH, benzoic acid and 9-fluorinone will be more soluble in the organic layer. So we'll remove the aqueous layer uh, and isolate benzocaine that way. Then eventually we are going to uh, add base to the organic layer, we have two phases of course. Benzoic acid will be deprotonated as its benzoate salt, and then that conjugate base will be more water soluble. And so then we can extract it away from the organic layer and the organic layer will always contain the 9-fluorinone, which is much more soluble uh, in a lipophilic, aka hydrophobic environment. The 9-fluorinone will not dissolve in the aqueous layer regardless of its pH. All right, so uh, we've already gone ahead and pre-weighed out every um, uh, solid here. So all of the three components are solids. And so the first one we're dealing with is uh, 51 milligrams. Uh, and this is 51 milligrams of benzoic acid. So uh, we showed you last week what benzoic acid looks like. Uh, it's this nice white crystalline solid, little, little needles up top towards the cap. Uh, and so we're gonna be dealing with that white solid and we're going to combine it in a, in a culture tube. In the same culture tube, then we're gonna combine the other two organic solids. We're starting with 56 milligrams of 9 fluorin oh, excuse me, of, <laughs> of 9 fluorinone uh, sold from Sigma Aldrich. And we see that this is uh, the first organic solid that has a color to it, right? It's sort of like um, a canary yellow type color. And so if we open the bottle, uh, we can see uh, that it's very nice, shiny. Um, yellow crystals of 9-fluorinone in there and it's uh, not surprising that this compound is uh, not white uh, due to the fact that you've got conjugation with the carbonyl uh, and so as a result when it absorbs light uh, it gives off uh, the wavelength of um, yellow to our eye and so there we are going to start with 56 milligrams of 9-fluorinone. And then lastly, uh, benzocaine, which is a white solid, 52 milligrams. And uh, so this is benzocaine. And if we look just to see what this solid looks like, we can see that um, these are 
these are, this is sold as like a large clump, uh, but it can be broken apart and you see here that it's also nice, white, shiny, uh, crystalline, organic, solid, right? Um, and so uh, if you were to use it as a local anesthetic, of course, um, it might be dissolved in a solution uh, and you, or some sort of lollipop, I know that they've got it for lollipops for children that are teething, uh, but um, in, in its pure form, benzocaine is a white crystalline solid. Okay, so we're going to take benzocaine, our basic compound. We are going to take 9-fluorinone, which is our neutral compound, and we are going to take benzoic acid, which is our acidic compound, and combine them into the same culture tube. All right, so in our notebook, we've recorded the original masses of benzoic acid, benzocaine, and 9-fluorinone our acidic, basic, and neutral compounds, respectively. Uh, and then also we went ahead and took the tear weights of uh, two aluminum weighing dishes, which we are going to use to collect uh, the acidic and basic compounds. And then we also took the tear weight for uh, the culture tube that we will use to isolate the neutral compound. And so here, once again, we've got our three compounds in a row. Uh, this is uh, 51 milligrams of benzoic acid. This is 56, oh, excuse me, 52 milligrams of benzocaine. And then here, this is 56 milligrams of 9 fluorinone. So we're going to combine it into a culture tube. Use the 50 milliliter beaker just to help hold it up. So I take the two edges, remember, and I make some a little cone to help me transfer the solid into the culture tube. So that was our acid. Our base. And then lastly, our neutral compound, which will always be dissolved in the organic layer. And our organic solvent is methylene chloride, AKA dichloromethane. And so this halogenated organic solvent will always be on the bottom layer. It is more dense than water. Its density is 1.33. So now you can see um, we've got our three compounds mixed in there. So you can even swirl it around. Right? And so ultimately now, uh, you know, we started out with them isolated, but the whole point of the experiment is to then put them together and then see how we can then isolate them back and then uh, determine how good we were um, in terms of separation, right? So for example, we started with 51 milligrams of benzoic acid. If we end up collecting 51 milligrams back, that means we did a 100% good job, but of course, uh, we're not going to see that, but hopefully we get somewhere close in the 90s. All right, so now to uh, this culture tube, uh, we are then going to add two milliliters of methylene chloride, and methylene chloride is going to dissolve each of the um, organic solids. And so I'm using here just a uh, graduated plastic disposable pipette, uh, and this level here uh, if you can see it, the graduation says 2 ml. So I'm then going to quickly add this. And I'm going to actually also rinse the sides of the culture tube so that all the compound that sort of stuck to the sides is going down and meeting the rest of the solids. Uh, but from the partition coefficient experiment, we know that it takes a little long for uh, the benzoic acid to dissolve. Um, but 9-fluorinone nine, nine immediately dissolved in our uh, organic um, uh, methylene chloride solvent. 9-fluorinone right? nine, nine is completely dissolved. We just have a couple pieces of white solid. Uh, and that was our benzocaine. And we knew from the partition coefficient that it takes 
a, a little bit longer for benzoic acid to, to dissolve. So before we um, continue, we're going we're to just let this set aside uh, and discuss the theory of uh, the first extraction, because our first extraction, uh, our aqueous layer is going to have a low pH, so it's going to be acidic. Um, and so we're going to use acid to isolate our base. So let's take a look at the structures here. So once again, this is our base, and so we're going to use acid to isolate benzocaine. Uh, and we're going to use acid because we're going to protonate benzocaine, and its conjugate acid is a salt, and therefore will be much more water soluble. Uh, and then we will extract the aqueous layer, therefore removing benzocaine from the organic layer. Uh, and so let's just have a quick discussion about acid-base chemistry. So we know that um, amines are basic. Amines are basic. And so uh, just to compare uh, structures with benzocaine, the first one that we have here uh, is cyclohexylamine. So we've got an amino group bonded to a cyclohexane ring system. And uh, this is sp3 hybridized. Uh, we can say that this is a primary aliphatic amine. Uh, and so this amine is basic, and so if we have some uh, hydrogen halide acid, so for example HCl, uh, the nitrogen lone pair uh, will be protonated, so we're forming the nitrogen proton bond, and then the proton halogen bond of course is breaking, uh, and then um, from protonation then uh, your counter anion in this sense is going to be the halide ion. So cyclohexylamine gets protonated, and now you have its conjugate acid. Um, and so if our halogen atom here is chloride, uh, we would call this uh, cyclohexyl ammonium chloride. So then this is a salt. Anytime you have ammonium or onium, this is indicative of a, of a positive charge. And so this is the conjugate acid of cyclohexylamine. This is water soluble, much more water soluble relative to its free base amine. Its pKa is 10.64, and this is in the very typical range of um, aliphatic amines, where the nitrogen is sp3 hybridized. So for example, methylamine, CH3, NH2, uh, when protonated as its conjugate acid, so methyl ammonium ion, also coincidentally has the same pKa value of 10.64. So usually we say pKa of around 11 uh, for um, aliphatic uh, ammonium salts, and they can go as low as about 8.3 if you're talking about uh, morpholine, uh, but generally we say it's just around 10 to 11. Now, on the other hand, when you have a, an amino group, so this is an amino group, bonded to a benzene ring, uh, the situation has changed. So rather than a uh, six-membered uh, uh, chair conformation uh, cyclohexane ring, right, where each carbon atom is sp3 hybridized, now we've got the nitrogen atom bonded to a benzene ring. And so the, um, the basicity of this nitrogen is drastically different. And the reason is because this lone pair of nitrogen is spending a lot of time resonating inside of the benzene ring. So this lone pair of electrons, we can show multiple resonance structures where this lone pair of electrons comes down here, forms a nitrogen carbon double bond, and then these pi electrons move here to this ortho carbon, and that would be one resonance structure. And then we can keep going. Those lone pairs could then form a double bond here, and then the, this pi bond could put the lone pair of electrons in the para position, and then you can keep going, right? So you can have uh, one, two, three, four, five resonance structures. So as a result, the lone pair electrons on nitrogen are delocalized, unlike the sp3 hybridized nitrogen atom of cyclohexylamine. This, these lone pairs are much more available to being protonated, so therefore we would say much more basic. These lone pair of electrons, however, are not because of the fact that they are so delocalized within the benzene ring. Uh, and we actually can see that within the pKa data. So if you protonate aniline, you then get its uh, conjugate acid, which we call anilinium. 
So uh, analinium has a pKa value of 4.63. Remember, lower the pKa, stronger the acid. So just examining these two data points, 10.64 versus 4.63, that's hugely significant. Remember that pKa is a logarithmic scale, so this, this difference in acidity is approximately 10 to the 6, uh, to 10 to the 6th. In other words, analinium conjugate acid is about a million times more acidic than the conjugate acid of cyclohexylamine. All right? We can also say that the conjugate acid of cyclohexylamine is much more stable than the conjugate acid of aniline, right? Because when we've cotonated the lone pair of an aniline now, we no longer have the delocalization of electrons. And so why is this relevant? Well, now let's examine the structure of uh, benzocaine. And so benzocaine, uh, we've got um, an ethyl ester here. This would be, if I cover up this nitrogen for a second, that would be ethyl benzoate. And now once I've got that nitrogen there in the para position, uh, now it's the ethyl ester of para-amino uh, uh, benzoic acid. So uh, it's abbreviated P-A-B-A, para-amino benzoic acid. So you might have heard of PABAs before. Anyhow, um, you can the IUPAC name could also be named uh, as the ethyl ester. So ethyl space para-amino benzoate because we name uh, esters like we do the conjugate bases of uh, the carboxylate salts. So this is a benzoate ester. It's the ethyl ester of paraamino benzoic acid. So um, what we can say about this, similar to the nitrogen lone pair of aniline, this nitrogen lone pair, this amino group bonded to this benzene ring is also delocalized within the benzene ring. Therefore, this nitrogen lone pair, we will expect to be uh, much less basic than, for instance, a primary ammonium, uh, or excuse me, a primary amine, all right? So this, just by comparing this, this nitrogen is an aniline-type nitrogen, okay? So this lone pair is not very uh, basic. Um, however, we can uh, protonate benzocaine. So this is the structure of benzocaine. Uh, we can protonate it, but we need to use strong acid. Uh, so the strong acid that we're going to use is uh, hydrochloric acid. We're going to start with three molar hydrochloric acid. And what we're going to expect is that um, given the knowledge that these lone pairs resonate within the ring, we also know that the uh, pi electrons could then resonate out onto the carbonyl oxygen. So what we're going to see is that uh, in theory, protonation is actually going to occur at the carbonyl oxygen rather than nitrogen, because if we protonate here, we then have uh, a conjugate acid with resonance stabilization. So um, this is the structure here that I'm talking about. Um, so we've protonated the carbonyl of benzocaine, and what happened is that the nitrogen uh, now has a positive formal charge, and we can draw multiple resonance contributors. So on the next page, Let's just go ahead and uh, draw that together. So I'm just going to redraw benzocaine. And what I'm saying is that this nitrogen lone pair uh, is delocalized within the benzene ring and also out onto the um, carbonyl oxygen, right? So one resonance structure that I could show is what I was saying before, the nitrogen lone pair could be a carbon-nitrogen double bond, and then these pi electrons become uh, a lone pair on the ortho carbon. All right, so here, for instance, is one resonance structure. And this is still just of uh, neutral benzocaine. But what I'm trying to emphasize here uh, is that this um, uh, dipolar resonance structure is illustrating you uh, illustrating to you the fact that um, these lonely pairs of electrons on nitrogen are actually delocalized over this whole conjugated pi system, right? And I could keep going. So what I could show then um, is that if nitrogen is 
protonated directly, we then destroy this opportunity for delocalization. So what's most likely is that protonation will occur at this carbonyl oxygen. And so we're adding uh, HCl, which is really hydronium chloride, three molar. And so I'm gonna show that the um, carbonyl oxygen gets protonated. And you might be saying, well, we know that the amines are basic, what's going on here? Well, we're not protonating the nitrogen lone pair electrons once again, because then we would destroy uh, resonance stabilization. So now this conjugate acid, which would be pro we would call protonated benzocaine, has multiple resonance structures. So just like I showed up here now, what I can do is I can take this lone pair, create a nitrogen carbon double bond. I can take these pi electrons of the benzene ring and put a carbon carbon double bond here. I can then extend these pi electrons out onto this carbonyl and this carbon here to form a double bond. And then now these pi electrons can become a lone pair on oxygen uh, and then getting rid of the positive charge on oxygen and instead now these arrows would show the positive charge on nitrogen, right? So this would just be uh, one of the several resonance structures. So on and so forth. So uh, as practice, um, I urge you to uh, try and draw the other resonance structures um, that are possible. So we can just call this protonated benzocaine. But regardless, because this nitrogen atom uh, really isn't that of uh, a, a, an aliphatic amine, it's more like an aniline, uh, it has, it's not as basic and therefore its conjugate acid has a lower pKa value than even aniline. It's about two and a half estimated. Um, and so if we go back here for a second, what we can actually really describe this functional group as is a vanilligous carbamate. So a carbamate has uh, an amino group uh, and uh, an OR group, where R is some hydrocarbon chain, in this instance, ethyl. Uh, and so this is one of the unique uh, functional groups that we will be learning about. Uh, they're also known as urethanes. So we're calling it vanilligous carbamates because the nitrogen isn't directly bonded to the carbonyl, uh, but it's extended through this pi network. Um, and so this is one reason why we are going to rationalize that benzocaine is much less uh, basic than not only aniline, of course, than much less basic than cyclohexylamine. So this is the important theory to consider, but nonetheless, we're still gonna be able to protonate uh, benzocaine and then when we protonate benzocaine, uh, this salt, and we should show the counter anion, is much more soluble in the aqueous layer, the top aqueous layer, rather than the lower methylene chloride layer. All right, so hopefully that theory makes sense. Review it because acid-base chemistry is extremely important. Now at this point in time, uh, after discussing the acid-base chemistry, we see that uh, everything here is dissolved, right? So this is a clear solution now, um, but it's a, a yellow solution. And uh, this is methylene chloride with 9-fluoronone, benzocaine, and benzoic acid. To this, we are now going to add 3-molar hydrochloric acid. So here I've got hydrochloric acid, and um, we are going to add 2 milliliters of this, and we're going to do so twice to extract the benzocaine out as that uh, benzocaine salt, and we're going to, going to extract it away from uh, the uh, organic layer. My pipette doesn't fit down in there, so I'm going to add the HCl uh, to a graduated cylinder. It doesn't have to be perfectly too. I just want to be able to reach it with my pipette and not have to dive too far down in that bottle. Okay, so uh, once again, I'm using the disposable graduated pipette and I'm looking for 
uh, two milliliters. So this is approximately two milliliters. And of course, we're going to see as we add the uh, aqueous hydrochloric acid, just here's one drop for you, we're going to see that it's going to sit on top of the organic layer, right? So just like uh, we're the partition coefficient experiment, we now see two phases, two layers. So the top layer is our aqueous layer, it's the three molar hydrochloric acid, and the bottom layer, uh, of course, still is our um, uh, methylene chloride organic layer, right? And it's always easy to remember this is because the 9-fluorinone, which is yellow, will always remain in the organic layer because it is neutral. So it's always more soluble in the organic layer, regardless the pH of our aqueous layer. Right now, our pH, of course, is very low because we've got 3 molar hydrochloric acid. So what's happening now as I mix this is that the benzocaine uh, will be protonated and the salt then will uh, be more soluble in the aqueous layer. So we've got um, caps for these culture tubes, but they tend to leak. So I'm not gonna uh, shake it up and down like I did before with my um, five milliliter reaction vial when we did the partition coefficient, but rather I'm just gonna do it this way. Uh, and this, this is still good enough. So remember what now is happening is that the, um, I'm of course trying to mix the two layers as best as I can, but eventually they'll still separate once I stop agitating the culture tube. But what's going on in there is that in the aqueous layer, uh, the benzocaine uh, is being protonated. It, it is now a, the salt, the protonated benzocaine, and it's going to be more soluble in the top aqueous layer. So what we're doing is we're moving it from the lower uh, organic layer. That's the idea there. Which, and this is just, again, emphasizing how important it is to understand your um, acid-base chemistry. This is sort of an ugly looking test tube rack, slightly better. <laughs> All right, so. So we'll wait just a little bit and we see that the, uh, the, the two layers now have clearly separated. And once again, aqueous top layer, lower organic layer. In the organic layer, there's still benzoic acid and 9-fluorinone. In our aqueous layer, we're expecting it to be the um, protonated benzocaine. And so now what we're going to do is that we are going to use a pasture pipette and this is the liquid-liquid extraction part. We're going to add the organic layer to this three, uh, 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. So we got a nine inch uh, pasture pipette. Oh, this is a hard rubber one. It'll still work. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna be very careful to try and balance this. Now I'm removing the aqueous layer, and we're hoping that this aqueous layer has removed the benzocaine from the organic layer. And I'm trying to be as careful as possible to not draw up any methylene chloride. The nice thing about it is that if I accidentally do, I'll see that it is yellow and just dispel it back into my culture tube. But sometimes this happens where the uh, layers get somewhat confused. So due to the density um, factors. So now you see I've, I've drawn some up purposefully in my pasture pipette and I'm going to get rid of that organic layer. And then I see this is now aqueous. And then very slowly we see that little bit that hung above the meniscus. 
and it's doing that uh, because not because the methylene chloride isn't really um, less dense than the solution, but the density isn't exactly uh, the three molar hydrochloric acid is of course more dense than just normal water. So we saw that there was some confusion there. The top of the aqueous layer, I'll point it out again, had some methylene chloride floating on top. It can also have something to do with surface tension. Um, but we're, we did a pretty good transfer, but in order to really um, try and get as much as possible, we're going to re repeat this process. Uh, and so this is a change to the procedure. We're going to repeat it uh, because I can do it faster, hopefully, then um, we'll hopefully get a better isolated yield. So let me cap it just in case. I don't need that for you all HCL anymore. So I'm mixing the two layers. Um, we're hoping that any uh, extra benzocaine that we didn't catch in the first extraction is now going to go into our aqueous, uh, our top aqueous acidic layer. All right, we'll let the two layers separate. And I'm using the same pipette to then add it to uh, our 10 milliliter uh, Erlenmeyer flask. And um, in this we are going to place this uh, in, a, in an ice bath um, in, the, in, the, in the interim. Um, and so I'm going to use a 50 milliliter beaker uh, to make an ice water bath to nestle the uh, 10 milliliter flask in it. So what that's going to do is decrease the solubility of uh, uh, our benzocaine, which we ultimately want. Um, and so uh, we're also going to place it in an ice water bath because we're, we're a, little, a little wary of possible hydrolysis. So I'll be right back with some ice. All right, so we gave the uh, culture tube a little time for the layers to separate. Once again, we've got uh, uh, the lower um, organic layer, methylene chloride, which has the 9-fluorinone and benzoic acid, and the upper 3-molar hydrochloric acid aqueous layer should have our protonated benzocaine. Okay? Um, remember that under these acidic conditions, benzoic acid still remains protonated as its native carboxylic acid. So as a result, it's still more soluble in methylene chloride at this moment, all right? So I'm gonna, again, uh, very carefully, I'm using the same pipette now, uh, draw up my aqueous layer and combine it with my first extraction. And so you can sort of see that methylene chloride layer that's kind of on top, which is annoying, but it always happens. So you have to be vigilant and try and avoid that. But we do our best. I think we're doing great. Yeah, and we avoided drawing up any methylene chloride that has the benzoic acid and 9 fluorinone at this point in time. All right, so now, 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask has the protonated benzocaine, the salt, the water-soluble salt, and this organic layer I'm going to set aside for a second. All right, now, obviously, since this is 3 molar hydrochloric acid, uh, it's going to have a very low pH, and let's just convince ourselves of that. Um, I mean, here's the, here's the three molar, I don't wanna lose any material just yet. Here's the three molar HCL, and I'm just gonna to touch uh, the glass to the tip of um, uh, pH paper. I see that we've got the color red, and if we look at the legend here, red is very strongly acidic, so pH two to zero, okay? So at this point, um, what we can say is that if the pH is around uh, zero, or one, um, that the majority of the benzocaine is going to be protonated. And we can actually prove that or demonstrate that with the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, but for right now, you just have to take uh, our word for it, okay? Now I'm placing my 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask into an ice water bath, and at this point, um, I want my benzocaine back. I don't want it as the 
water-soluble salt anymore. I want it as the free base, okay? So what I'm gonna do now instead is use uh, sodium hydroxide uh, in order to do that. And here I've got um, the bottle of it. This is a six molar solution of sodium hydroxide. Let me open this over the sink because someone has spilled some, some on top and it's evaporated and so that's all sodium hydroxide. I changed my glove, remind me. Uh, and so uh, we're gonna add uh, two milliliters of this sodium hydroxide. So that was about spot on. And uh, when we add uh, the, the sodium hydroxide, we're aiming for a pH of around uh, five to neutral pH of seven. So if we get in here, uh, don't confuse the ice for solid just yet, but we should see that as we add the sodium hydroxide, our uh, benzocaine should uh, precipitate, right? Because we are neutralizing uh, the acidic conditions. And as a result, we are freebasing. You can sort of see that already, even just with one drop. Drop. See, now it's even more visible. So that as it drops, that white material that's sort of falling and then being pushed away, right? That should be our benzocaine precipitating out of solution uh, because it is the benzocaine itself is not water soluble. So what we're doing is we're deprotonating uh, the um, hydrochloride salt of benzocaine, protonated benzocaine, of course. Um, and so this process is called freebasing. And what we're getting back then is going to be our free base uh, amine. So now you can really see that we've got a lot of material coming out. So I've added two milliliters. And let's go ahead and take it out of flask just so we can see how much we've got. We'll look at it edge on. And look, we've, we've got, we've precipitated that solid now. And this solid, this solid is uh, the free base. Wipe off the water so we can get a better visual. This white solid now, if I swirl it around, you see that, that is uh, now benzocaine, right? This should, this is now neutral benzocaine. Uh, we've neutralized the solution with six molar sodium hydroxide. So now we're gonna test the pH. It should be uh, uh, near neutral, um, or perhaps we added so much that it's now basic, uh, but it's good that we're seeing solid because that's then we're, we're, how we're gonna isolate the benzocaine via vacuum filtration. So I'm still gonna keep it in the ice water bath because of course that'll decrease the solubility and will maximize our percent isolation. And so I'm gonna use uh, the same um, stir rod, but I'm going to rinse it real quick because it has some residual HCl on it, of course. And now we're going to test the pH of um, our aqueous layer that has now the, the benzocaine precipitated out. And now it's blue. And so that means I added too much base, but it's okay. Uh, this means that it's strongly alkaline. In fact, look the um, tip of the stir rod. Benzocaine free base is stuck to the glass stir rod there. So I'll probably use this to help me um, scrape everything out of the flask in terms of filtering it. And then you can even see a little white solid on the pH paper itself. Uh, and the blue is telling us that this is strongly acidic. So we're, we have it chilling, um, and what we want to do then is now isolate the solid uh, via vacuum filtration. Remember, we use vacuum filtration to isolate a solid. Uh, we use gravity filtration if we want the liquid. So we're gonna migrate over. We've already set up our um, Hirsch funnel connected to uh, our ring stand, right? And here's our rubber tubing 
uh, connected to our sidearm filter flask. And uh, in there is already um, a Wattman paper uh, filter. So I'm gonna turn on our vacuum. You can even hear it. Uh, and we're gonna try and quickly get everything over in there. Um, and it's unfortunate that it's too basic because I don't wanna hurt the paper, the filter paper, but that's what we're dealing with. So I'm swirling it around so that the lazy solid is gonna come with the liquid as I pour it quickly. But I know that some is still gonna stick to the sides of the flask. So the water is filtering through and uh, the benzocaine now that's stuck to the flask. I'm gonna try and get rid of it, not get rid of it, but scrape it out as best I can. And we see that now we've got our uh, benzocaine, our um, filtrate has gone through and now we're interested in this white solid benzocaine. So just remember, look back at the video and remember how benzocaine looked uh, looks pretty darn similar. Um, and so what we might want to do is just rinse it with a little bit of deionized water um, just because we had it so uh, basic. But it'll also help us uh, get rid of the residue that's stuck onto this um, 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. So I'm just going to use a little bit of deionized water. Um, I don't want to use too much, so hopefully my... Yeah, so that's good. All right. And I'm going to just sort of try and collect all of this stuff that's on the sides. And use my glass stir rod to help push out the stuck benzocaine. And at the same time, what this is doing is it's going to wash the uh, solid there of any residual base. And uh, we're not too concerned about the, this benzocaine dissolving in water. If you were, you could use cold water instead. Or alternatively, I could even put a good amount as the last rinse. Get it cold. So this will be the last amount of, uh, the last wash, I should say, of benzocaine being filtered. I'm gonna make sure it's cold once again to be sure that not any of it, or, or be, to be sure that it's really uh, not soluble in water. And I'm also going to now be able to wash the glass stir rod. And doing this, I can aim the water directly over the benzene. All right, so this has helped me affect a quantitative transfer or attempt one anyhow, and also I've rinsed the solid of any residual uh, base. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to allow this, uh, uh, the air to pass over this for some, some time and continue on our, with our experiment. Um, and so that's just to uh, dry the benzocaine. So we're gonna leave the vacuum on and have the air uh, pass through it. Over here, just adjacent, this is our um, teared aluminum weighing dish. We have the data already written down. We have the tear weight of this. And so eventually we'll get this dry as we complete our experiment. And then we'll figure out, uh, we'll measure how much benzocaine we've isolated. Ready? Okay, so. Uh, now that we've uh, separated the um, benzocaine, all that's left in our organic layer now is uh, nine fluorinone and benzoic acid. So we already know how to separate benzoic acid from methylene chloride. We use base. Um, in the partition coefficient, we used uh, a saturated solution of sodium bicarbonate. Here we are going to use uh, three molar sodium hydroxide. Um, so, I've got a pipette 
graduated pipette that I labeled here. Uh, and we're gonna do the same uh, volumes. So we're gonna use two milliliters and we're gonna repeat this twice, just like we did uh, with our acid uh, to isolate our base. This is now the base to isolate our carboxylic acid. So uh, once again, you're gonna see as I add the sodium hydroxide, we have two layers forming. We also already see something precipitating out, but then it goes away. Um, and if the, if the thing can catch it well enough, if I shake it just gently, you can see, well, I can, I don't know if the camera can, you can see this effect known as Schlieren. It's a German word uh, for changes in density, density. Uh, which happens when you've got changes in concentration of a solution. Uh, even when you've got um, changes in density, like of air. So if you ever look at um, hot asphalt, you can see the air sort of waving. That effect is also called Schlieren. Uh, and you can also see it when you're heating something. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's something to, it's nice to look at and be aware of. Um, Schlieren is partially responsible for what someone might see as a mirage in the desert and might, might think that it's a pool of water, but it's not. So if you can see, can, you, can the camera see that? Sort of. I think what's more impressive is that little bubble of methylene chloride and trying to decide whether or not it should go to the top or the bottom layer because the methylene chloride just a little bit of it hangs out up top which is frustrating okay so I'm gonna cap it now shake it just like we did before and what's going on is that I'm deprotonating the neutral benzoic acid and as a result, I'm removing it from the organic layer and it's going to dissolve as its sodium benzoate salts in the top aqueous layer. So let's take a look at the structures as I'm uh, mixing this. So of course, we've got uh, benzoic acid. So this is a, a carboxylic acid. The carboxyl group is bonded to a benzene ring uh, and its pKa is uh, in the typical range of carboxylic acids, so 4.19. Um, a little bit more acidic than acetic acid due to the electron withdrawing benzene ring. And what we just added was a 3 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide we know is a strong base, benzoic acid is a weak acid, and so hydroxide ion is going to deprotonate uh, uh, benzoic acid. And I'm just going to show one of the resonance structures like this, so I'm forming uh, this oxygen proton bond, so hydroxide is becoming its conjugate acid, water, and benzoic acid is becoming its, benzo its uh, conjugate base, benzoate. And so the, the proton is being deprotonated from this oxygen, and I'm also at the same time showing the oxygen-carbon pi bond forming so that this oxygen becomes part of the carbonyl, and that this pi bond here becomes part of the lone pair of this oxygen which will be negatively charged. And so that's this structure here, right? And I, you don't necessarily have to show this. You could show uh, these bonding electrons going to this oxygen and just draw that benzoate ion, anion. But I'm doing this to emphasize resonance. So I've got this resonance structure now. And remember, the carboxylate anions are stabilized by resonance. So I can now take this lone pair reform my oxygen carbon double bond here and now these two pi electrons become a lone pair on that oxygen atom, right and so we've got here two resonance contributors and so um, the negative charge is spread over two oxygen atoms and so we say that the uh, conjugate base sodium benzoate is stabilized by resonance and if you wanted to, you could draw a resonance hybrid structure uh, where half of the time the negative charge is here and the other half of the time the negative charge is here. Right? And so uh, to draw the hybrid, I've got my benzene ring, and then I'm drawing these dashed lines to indicate that at any point in time, 
this could be the carbonyl or uh, this oxygen could be part of, part of the carbonyl system and therefore I can also use a little lowercase Greek letter delta negative one half or Greek letter delta negative one half uh, to say that uh, the charge is spread out over these two atoms, these two oxygen atoms, all right? So anyway, this is the acid-base theory going on, right? And the emphasis is now that this sodium benzoate is water soluble. So our only our nine fluoronone now, our neutral nine fluoronone should be dissolved in the lower organic layer, the methylene chloride. And now in our basic layer, uh, after the proton transfer events, which I was doing when I was mixing this, um, in the top aqueous layer, our top basic aqueous layer should now just be sodium benzoate. And now uh, what we're going to do similarly is that we're going to separate the two layers, our two phases, uh, and this, the procedure here says to use uh, a 25 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, and we're also going to nestle this in an ice bath. So um, we can see that this is since my most recent shake, uh, it's still, uh, the two layers are still separating. So I'll, I'm just gonna go grab some ice while that happens. Okay, so I've got my ice water bath. And once again, we're gonna separate our two layers. So uh, the top layer is always the aqueous layer. I'm gonna use a new uh, pasture pet pet to avoid contamination. Just like we did before, this is now our liquid liquid extraction uh, and on a micro scale of course um, what we should show you is actually um, the large scale that we normally do which is with a uh, separatory funnel but here we're doing it on a micro scale to minimize waste but anyway uh, so here's now transferring over that first amount of basic aqueous layer with sodium benzoate. Diving down again to get more. Trying to avoid the yellow methylene chloride layer as best I can. But again, it's difficult because of that fraction here. I, you can barely see the glass tip of the pipette. But wow, that was cool. All right, so now this is our first extraction. And so once again, we're going to repeat this. So I'm going to add another 2 ml of um, 3 molar sodium hydroxide. milliliters to my culture tube to repeat the extraction All right and again this is to try and get as much sodium benzoate over as possible because we started with what 52 milligrams hopefully we'll get back a similar amount or something close to it um, if we were good with our extraction methods or our technique I should say and so you see that they're separating it's kind of cool to watch So now the bottom organic layer, the methylene chloride, has all of the 9 fluorinone, and then the uh, top aqueous basic layer should have any remaining uh, sodium benzoate, right? So there should be no benzoic acid here because we've deprotonated it all, and uh, it's much more water soluble, right? We even calculated the partition coefficient for it. Okay, so um, use that same pipette. I'm gonna combine the two basic aqueous layers.
Is my hand in the way or no? Nope. All right. Combining that. Going in for more. Trying to avoid the methylene chloride. see any yellow in my pipette and so you can get real close just to see that the, there's a pool of there's a, a layer of methylene chloride on top that is, is sort of concave and then the uh, layer that's so close the rest of the methylene chloride is almost meeting it it's like a contact lens almost and maybe once I get rid of that, you see that, that's really cool. Getting rid of any yellow that might be in the pasture pipette. And then that's, that's the best I can do. Um, any residual water we're gonna get rid of with a um, uh, wash of just neutral water later. Okay, so now in that, methylene chloride should only be nine fluorinone. In our 25 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, our two combined basic aqueous layers uh, should be sodium benzoate. We're gonna chill it. And now ask yourself, how are we going to now isolate the benzoic acid? Well, we are going to protonate and we're going to um, use uh, hydrochloric acid. We're going to use six molar hydrochloric acid to do that. Uh, and so, this one and so firstly what, what's going to happen is we're going to neutralize of course the uh, the fact that this solution is exceedingly basic um, and as a result what's going to happen is we're going to protonate sodium benzoate back to benzoic acid and we know that benzoic acid is not very water soluble all right and so i'm just going to get a, two new pieces of um pH paper so that we can convince ourselves that's what we're doing. Um, and my glass thermometer is over there. I'm using that at the moment. And here's now a new glass stir rod going to uh, touch down in there. Even on pond chilling, we don't see any solid because it's still sodium benzoate dissolved in uh, water. By the way, sodium benzoate is a preservative. You see it listed in a lot of foodstuffs, even sodas. So uh, there we have it. We've got blue, of course. We expect that because we used um, uh, sodium hydroxide. So this is a pH around uh, 10 to 12. So very basic. And so now we're going to add um, six molar hydrochloric acid. And this six molar hydrochloric acid, um, we're going to start with around two milliliters. And we don't really need to chill it because we're not afraid of hydrolysis or anything. We're going to chill it for a little bit to decrease the solubility of uh, benzoic acid. But let's just watch uh, the, the effect. So if we get... No solid, no nothing. So let's look again for that Schlieren effect that I had mentioned. It's because it's so cold. 
but you might be able to see it. Um, and also what's happening, obviously, besides just neutralizing the basic water, is we should eventually begin to see uh, benzoic acid precipitate out. So let me just swirl this. And now you can clearly see the Schlieren edge on. You see that all happening? So uh, that's a little bit more. You see that the, uh, they're totally combining now. There's that Schlieren again. So if I touch this, now it's room temperature because the proton transfer, this is exothermic. Do it some more, we still see that Schlieren. And we should eventually start to see the um, benzoic acid precipitate out a solution, um, but perhaps we need to put it back on ice for that to occur. But I do see some solid. I see some solid now um, circulating around. Let's test the pH. We want the pH to be around 2. Less than 2 even. So. Wow, look at that. It's still very basic. So we're adding more. Let's try another two milliliters. So let's go down edge on again and see. You should see that effect. even start seeing something precipitate. I do a little bit. And once again, let's just swirl it gently. And you see that. Now we see the solid start to form, right? So hopefully you can see that on the screen. Look at those crystals now forming and coming out of solution, right? I'm mixing it clearly together. We also see some benzoic acid start to stick to the top side of the flask here. Um, but just upon swirling now, I've really mixed the two uh, and benzoic acid has precipitated out of solution. So um, once we measure the pH again, it's gonna be much lower um, because now we've protonated all of the benzoate and we have the native carboxylic acid, which is water uh, insoluble. So let's test that pH now. Really? Still that basic? Oh, no, of course not. All right, so now we're in acidic territory and this is what we're looking for, all right? So, and obviously this is acidic because we've got the benzoic acid precipitating out there, all right? And so we're gonna just um, leave this on ice for a little bit and then we will vacuum filter it just like we did the benzocan. All right, so now we've got our benzoic acid uh, in, in water, in acidic water, uh, and we've chilled it for some time to be sure uh, most of it has precipitated out. Uh, we've got our uh, Hirsch funnel with this rubber collar connected to the sidearm filter flask, and I'm now going to turn on the vacuum. All right, so we're ready to we're ready to go. Um, so I'm going to swirl it to try and get all the solid to come out at once. And now uh, we see that there's the um, uh, benzoic acid. And there's some residue, right? and there's still a little bit of water, so I'm gonna try and scrape uh, out some of this. 
I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm scraping down on this side, trying to get it in the remaining water that's present. And then doing that. All right. And so then the procedure says to um, rinse this with um, cold distilled water. So I've got a distilled water ice bath. And so I'm not going to use too much. What's this? This is a half ml. Add it to my Erlenmeyer flask here. Swirl it around to try and collect any solid that's stuck to the sides of the glass. And there's number one. Here's another half ml of cold water. Once again, trying to uh, rinse the sides of the flask. Wait for that all to come out. Water really likes glass. And uh, there's just a little bit left, so let's do just one more half ml for good luck. So what we've done there is we've effectively, uh, we've tried to get a really good quantitative transfer and we've also uh, washed our um, benzoic acid from any excess um, HCl. Uh, we're going to let the vacuum pass over the benzoic acid to dry it uh, and then eventually we're going to um, scrape the benzoic acid out of the Hirsch filter, fil the Hirsch filter uh, and uh, scrape it into the um, aluminum weighing dish that we had teared earlier. And so now it's time to move on to isolate our neutral 9-fluorinone, which has always remained in the organic. Okay, so now we've got our uh, just our methylene chloride, and what we want to do is we want to wash this um, with water, just to get rid of any residual um, uh, acid that might have been present from the uh, benzoic acid extraction. So uh, the procedure says to do two times one milliliter. So this is a one milliliter graduated disposable pipette. So I'm just gonna add one ml to it. I'm gently shake it, especially getting the sides to get any sort of uh, water that was there out. And this is pretty general. We wash the organic layer this way. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is then we're going to uh, combine the two aqueous washes and we're gonna uh, add it to another culture tube. We don't care about those aqueous washes. There's nothing in there that we want, but we're just gonna save it in case we accidentally made a mistake. That's, that's common practice. Leave everything uh, present until you know that you've actually done a good job. All right, so once I'm gonna use another pasture pipette, because this one was acidic. I want everything to be neutral water in there. I'm using deionized water. So we're getting another pasture pipette. And I'm just going to take the first aqueous wash There's no yellow, so that's good. I didn't draw up any methylene chloride. It's really hard to see. In this case, I did just towards the bottom. So now, and then we're gonna do that once more. So rinse the organic layer with deionized water. Really 
to see the layers separate. Wait for those bubbles to pop, so to speak. And now, same pasture pipette. I'm taking the second aqueous uh, wash out and I'm gonna combine it with the first. And once again, we don't care about anything in this water. It's just to wash the organic layer. Get rid of any residual acid. Definitely want to get rid of the water because, of course, we want our organic layer to be dry. All right, so I think that's the best I can do with my pipette. So um, how do we get rid of the rest of the water? We use anhydrous sodium sulfate. And so um, I'm going to want to transfer this organic layer to a new culture tube that hasn't seen any water yet. I, of course, then would want to use a new pasture pipette and um, add it to a completely dry new culture tube. All right. And so if I see any water present, I'm going to leave it behind. Uh, but I don't really. I really want these close together because I know that the vapor pressure of methylene chloride, it, it's already just spitting out. So that's the first one. See, I can see a little bit of water on either side, so that's what I'm trying to get away from. So you can see it in the pasture pipette bulb a little more clearly. So let's see if I can do, try and get it just right. really aiming my tip of the pasture pipette at the organic layer. But look, look in, the, in the stem of the pasture pipette. You can see that it's not the best job. So let's see if I can expel that. Then I got water. Then I got organic layer. Water. Organic layer. And let's see if I can do it again. I mean, I'm being really particular about this, but so water, organic. I mean, th it's just unavoidable at this point. I've tried to physically separate the two uh, the best I can. Um, but at least I don't see any more uh, nine fluorinone in here. This is, there's no color left, all right? So now I've transferred the um, nine fluorinone methylene chloride into a new culture tube, um, and I tried to really get it away from water. Um, but you can clearly see that there is some uh, because you can see it stuck to the sides of the glass. Methylene chloride does not do that. Right. So if I shake this, methylene chloride is not very viscous at all. It'll run down the tube completely. Also, you can see that there are some bubbles of water still remaining, uh, and definitely that water stuck to the sides of the glass there. So we're going to use um, anhydrous sodium sulfate. I'm going to use a scupula to add this. I do it over the sink just in case I spill some sodium sulfate. Right, and I already know that that's not going to be enough. Now 
let's check it out. All right, so you see that right away that those pieces that were free flowing are, are, are stuck, right? They're cemented down essentially in the bottom there. It's rock solid. And on the sides of the glass, it's not even moving. So let's add a little bit more. And don't worry about it overtaking everything because we're going to rinse everything with methylene chloride until we get rid of all of the yellow. So that we know we've got a quantitative transfer of uh, 9-fluorino, right? Because at this point, I really don't have much volume to be working with. Uh, so I'm going to rely on the column of uh, sodium sulfate to get rid of any remaining. So there you have it. I think if we wanted to um, add a little bit more and then add some new methylene chloride, fresh methylene chloride. I just really want to get this dry because there was a lot of water present still. So I'm just going to um, Add a little bit of methylene chloride here, um, just so we've got some more liquid to deal with, some headspace. We're evaporating off the methylene chloride eventually. So we can see something. All right, but A lot of sodium sulfate in there, but at least some of it is free flowing. So why don't we go ahead and just say that's the snow globe we're looking for and we've dried it the best we can. Um, the organic layer, if you look at it edge on, has definitely cleared up. So that means we've definitely gotten rid of, of the, uh, most of the water. And so we're gonna just let this sit for a little bit and let the sodium sulfate uh, dry the uh, organic layer a little more because it does take some time. All right, so now that we've uh, dried our organic layer, uh, all we have to do next is draw it up, uh, filter it through the five and three quarters inch pasture pipette uh, where we've um, added sodium sulfate to act as a filter. There's a piece of cotton there at the end. Um, so this is the last line of defense. It'll further dry the methylene chloride if it's not really super dry. Uh, and it'll also filter any uh, sodium sulfate that I might accidentally draw up in the pipette because you can see there are already some crystals that are up there and on the sides of the uh, tip as well. So. I mean, at this point, we're just trying to get the last bit of flavor out of the snow cone, so to speak. And, but we still see that the um, sodium sulfate is yellow. So we're gonna necessarily rinse it with um, fresh methylene chloride. But that's as best as I can do in terms of the first uh, amount coming up. All right, here's a little bit more. Slowly. 
we don't want to have too much solvent to then have to evaporate off. Also, we don't want to exceed the volume of the culture tube. Oh wow, the sodium sulfate in the pipette is causing the issue. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna rinse the sodium sulfate with methylene chloride. And um, we're going to uh, do this with, um, let's say a half ml several times. Actually, no, it's probably gotta be more like a milliliter because there's just so much sodium sulfate in there. But you can see, I, so I added that, that methylene chloride. Al already the, the yellow has started to dilute up there, but I've got to mix it. Um, let's see if I can get rid of the sodium sulfate that's causing the issue with this pipette. I think I'm going to have to use a new one. Yeah, it's so clogged. So this is the source of air. There's going to be a little bit left in this first pipette, but oh well. So I'm trying to mix it around a little bit. And you can see that the yellow color is being, becoming more dilute. But we really overloaded it with sodium sulfate. First round. So we're rinsing that sodium sulfate and also the, the sodium sulfate that's in the column itself. Try not to break the glass of the pasture pipette or choke my pasture pipette again. Yeah, we already feel. Tilting it this way hopefully helps. All right, that was washed, excuse me, number one. Do another milliliter. Fresh methylene chloride. All right, and so it's even more clear. It's clearing up even more. So obviously we're getting rid of the uh, remaining 9-fluorinone in there. Let's really shake it up. I'm going to try and break that apart with a spatula. I should have probably done that in the first place rather than trying to use glass. So now I've got more of a slush rather than some just hard ice that I'm trying to break through. Rinse this now, of course, too. 
So you can see why organic chemistry is so time consuming in the actual lab. Everything looks great and nice on paper, but when you're actually trying to do the reactions and then collect your product, it's much more time consuming than you might assume. All right, so that's moving around a little bit better now. pet is also choking. So this is really testing my patients. Do I want the remaining in there? I mean, the color is very apparent still, but it might be micrograms at this point. All right, this will be the last round. And I'm gonna pick up the column because I wanna get the tip out of the methylene cord in the bottom part. Right, I'm seeing that most of it has gone through. Remember the trick that I did last time, which is just give it a little pressure to really push everything out of there. And then it doesn't hurt uh, to use a little bit more methylene chloride, just a very, very, very small amount to rinse the sides of this pasture pipette, which was submerged in that methylene chloride layer, so that I'm really getting rid of every possible trace of it and into the now dry methylene chloride uh, in our teared culture tube. And so now what we're gonna do is we are going to put it on this hot sand bath, point it away from our faces, uh, boiling point uh, 44 degrees, so it should come off uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and then we'll be able to uh, get the mass of the culture tube with the uh, uh, fluorine. <laughs> Oh no, it bumped. I knew that was going to happen. Um, so that was a source of error. It bumped a little bit and it spit out of the culture tube. So we're going to lose some weight there. Um, but anyway, uh, so once we've got that um, mass, then we'll collect the masses of the, um, or we'll acquire the masses of the, the benzoic acid and the benzocaine. Okay, so we've got our culture tube. Uh, all of the methylene chloride has evaporated off, so we just have our uh, nine fluorinone in there. Of course, we've got um, our benzoic acid and benzocaine as well. Um, we went ahead and already uh, scraped out the uh, two solids from their respective Hirsch funnels, uh, and we know the tear weights of each of these. So um, we're going to weigh all of them acquire their masses and subtract the tear weights to determine how well we did in terms of uh, separating these three um, organic solids from the original methylene chloride solution of it. So this is 0 0.433, that's for uh, benzoic acid. Tear it in between, just to be safe. Here we've got now uh, benzocaine, and we've got 0 0.439. Tear it. And now for our culture tube with the fluorinone, 9 fluorinone. It's 11.673, all right? So um, those are the masses of each of these. And so what we need to do then is from those, subtract the tear weight. So um, let's go in order. So for benzocaine, 0.433 right here. 
that's 433 milligrams minus 0 0.410 is 23 milligrams. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that in, ter in terms of determining our percent isolation, it's going to be recovered, the amount of recovered material in milligrams over the original mass times 100 for percentage, of course. All right, so this would be 23 milligrams over 51, which is 45%. So we did 45% recovery for that one. Now let's do it for benzocaine. So 0.439 minus 0.411 equals 0 0.028 grams, which is 28 milligrams. Uh, we had that uh, over 52 milligrams uh, times uh, divide 28 by 52, multiply by 100, and we get 54 percent isolation. And then now, lastly, for the fluorinone, uh, we've got 11.636 was the tear weight of our culture tube, and we just weighed out 11.673 minus 11. Point 636 is 0 0.037 grams, which is 37 milligrams. So that divided by uh, 56 milligrams. So 37 over 56 is 0.66 times 100 is 66 percent. All right. So. Uh, it looks like we did the best at recovering our 9-fluorinone, which perhaps is unsurprising because we never really had to uh, do much to the organic layer except maintain its existence. Um, we can certainly say that uh, we, due to the fact that when we were boiling off the methylene chloride in this culture tube, right, we had accidentally uh, superheated it and uh, some of the solution bumped and uh, flew out, right? It bumped out of the culture tube, and so it c carried with it some of the 9 fluorinone. So we lost some of the material that way. Uh, and then for benzoic acid and benzocaine, um, again, we could say that we lost the material due to the fact that um, benzocaine is partially soluble in water, um, and maybe when we rinsed it, uh, either one of these with water that um, uh, we took some of it away that we were able to filter. Um, and then, of course, um, the amount that we isolated uh, wasn't close to the original mass because um, some of it was left uh, stuck to the sides of the walls of the Erlenmeyer flasks that we had chilled and also stuck to the porcelain of the Hirsch funnel and uh, what have you. But nonetheless, we did a pretty decent job. And in order to assess how um, thorough uh, the separation was, we have to take the melting points of each solid, right? Um, and so if we did a great job at really separating one from the other, the melting points of each of these three solids should match the literature. Okay, so we have to acquire the melting points now of our three compounds we isolated to make sure they are what we say they are. So inside the Digimelt, on the far left, I have uh, benzo we have benzoic acid. Um, presumably, in the middle, we have the benzocaine, and on the far right is the 9 form. Uh, so here, I have them set up in the same order. Um, uh, 9 fluorinone, the literature melting point is supposedly 83.5 degrees Celsius. Benzocaine is between 88 and 90, and benzoic acid, 122. So it should, uh, they should melt in uh, order starting from the right. So I have, um, to start the Digimelt, I have the start temp at 70 degrees for when it'll start slowing down, and the ramp rate at five, and the stop temp doesn't matter as long as it's over the highest one. Um, so it's 
not warming up yet, but it's when you click start, it'll preheat, and then I gotta click start again uh, when it's ready at the start temp. So I will tell you what the temperature is when they start to melt. And remember, we need a starting point and a stopping point. So the first sign of liquid is gonna be our start temp, because uh, they're gonna melt over a range. And then once it's completely liquid, we'll have that be the stop temp. So it hasn't even reached the start temp yet, and it looks like 940 is shrinking. It hasn't quite turned to liquid yet, but it has, it's shrunk. It's only at 63 degrees Celsius. So that is obvious impurities. So I'm gonna have the first start temp be at 65. So it's not quite all melted, but wow, it, quite a bit of it. It's not even 70 degrees yet. All right, but it, it just reached 70 or 69.5. So I'm gonna click start again. And now it will go past the, that point um, at, the, at the specified ramp rate. All right, so that's all liquid. It, that melted 65 to 70. Maybe the, either the literature is wrong or it was even pure. So again, we should expect to see benzocaine next at between 88 and 90. I'm gonna up the ramp right a bit because it's far away. It's, not it's at 10 degrees a minute. That's 74 degrees. 75. No signs of melting on either of them, not even shrinking, which is good. It's 80 degrees. Benzocaine should be starting soon. That is 88 degrees, and it started right on the money. So 88. It's all dissolved at 91. The ramp rate is a little fast, so it really probably was. I'm gonna write 91, but if it was at a slower ramp rate, uh, it's more accurate, obviously. So it, it probably was right on the money, so we can say that's pretty pure. I'm gonna up the ramp rate again, um, because we have a ways to go.
108 degrees Celsius. I just double checked the melting point for night floor and it claims it really is 83.5. So I think maybe we ought to take a second sample of our night floor and double check because it melted at between 65 and 70. to see benzoic acid melting soon. We're at 115 and its uh, literature melting point is 122. It's at 119. That's 120. Should start soon. There we go. Okay, so 121. 121. And it's all gone at 122. That matches the lit expected literature. Okay, we can shut it off now. I'm gonna, uh, I think we gotta retake 94 now. Right, so the Digimelt's getting ready. It's at 73. It shouldn't melt. If I put it in there and it melts, I think uh, it's just that there's all the methylene chloride hasn't boiled off, which is depressing it because methylene chloride boils really well. Yeah, it's melting right away. I think it's just uh, impurity because it's uh, not all the methylene chloride has uh, dissolved away. So uh, a more accurate melting point will be taken when it's more dry.